Um, so today I'm going to talk actually about uh, an AI commons and how we can get there. Something called the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. There are 17 of them in total, um, including no poverty, zero hunger, um, but also the ones that deeply matter for the next 12 years. That's the timeline we have that Greta has pointed out towards clean water, affordable and green energy, and basically not screwing up our planet. And so the UN rolled these out um, as goals, and it's basically become the KPIs for the United Nations. Um, you can actually measure these. There's more than 180 different measures. Can we use AI to drive towards the, the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals? There's actually now a summit. It started first in 2017. This is actually spearheaded by the ITU, which is the Telecommunications uh, Union of the uh, UN, as well as XPRIZE Foundation, ACM, and so on. So if we flesh out this ecosystem, there's not just the problem owners and the problem solvers, you've got the data owners. And it turns out that modern AI, especially regression and classification, loves data. You know, we hear about deep learning and all that. That's just one class of AI models. But this is the class of AI models. It's sort of a modern neural network that's just really, really big. Take the neural networks of 1962 and apply 50 years with the Moore's Law, and that's how you get deep learning. And that's for data as well as compute. So what's happened is actually people have said, Let, let's not train on just you know, 10,000 data points. Let's train on 10 million data points or even 10 billion data points and make this, this AI model that's actually accurate enough and feasible enough to run with. So that's the data owners. And they're usually talking to the problem owners a little bit. Um, and then there's also the storage and compute for the data itself and the problem solvers trying to run the storage and compute. So this fleshes out the ecosystem a little bit. You've got the problem owners, the problem solvers, the data owners, and the storage and compute. For the substrate to connect these, let's have a blockchain-based public utility network for the AI commons. This is probably the most detailed side and way too many words for this conference, but I'll flesh this out a little bit. So the data owners um, on the far left are um, interacting to different uh, service provider front ends. You know, they're basically supplying data, saying, hey, here's data. And there are, there's also people supplying um, markets for storage and for compute, right? And it, um, what are they getting in return? Well, for the priced stuff, um, they can be getting paid. But also, imagine if there was block rewards for people supplying data to the commons, right? Um, because overall, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to m spread the benefits of AI to the world. And um, to equalize the opportunity to access AI, it's really about spreading data, making data accessible to a much broader set of people. Um, so that's really what the far left is, the green. In the middle, there's also an, a, the idea of an AI commons front end. So the, the problem owners are engaging back and forth with an AI commons. This is where people specify the problems. And they're working very, very closely with the problem solvers because there's sort of this back and forth between solving the problem, re, uh, defining the problem with more clarity, et cetera. And um, those, front end, uh, those problem owners are defining the problem in something called Jupyter Notebooks. Who here actually knows about Jupyter Notebooks? Many people? Oh, wow, quite a few people. So as you probably know, you know, it started as IPython, Interactive Python, in about 2010, 2011, and um, you know, evolved and evolved into something called Jupyter. So it's not just Python, but more stuff. And in the last two or three years, Jupyter has really grown up. It's actually its own protocol now. It's a thin protocol. It's stateless. But um, it's really, uh, instead of being a, a side tool just for analysis at the tail end, it's actually become the center of infrastructure at large enterprises like Netflix. So um, Jupyter Notebooks are a wonderful way to specify a problem. So, um, in, in learning AI. You've got the inputs and you, the outputs, the sort of goal you're trying to solve and so on. So imagine if you can specify these problems in a, in a Jupyter notebook, um, but then you actually populate it, this into the public utility network. Then, of course, you've got the problem solvers. They can yank this out um, of the public utility network and start to solve it. And as they solve it, um, their computation, their storage, et cetera, can be um, recorded, the results especially, can be recorded um, into the public utility network and made available for everyone else. And so at the baseline here in this public utility network, um, there's really two ways to incentivize data. Um, one of them I've talked about very briefly, which is uh, block rewards for the data itself. So I can make data available for free for people to use. Um, so it's free for the consumers, but at the same time, um, uh, myself, I can get rewarded by inflation in the network. But um, it's my hypothesis that if you actually have this sort of yin and yang of a for-profit with the four commons at the same time, then you can actually, they can help each other, they feed each other. So imagine we can actually catalyze the commons and the profit making, and we have this substrate for a thousand marketplaces to, to bloom. So uh, marketplaces for buying and selling data, but not just raw data, it can also be cleaned data, it can be neural networks themselves uh, after they were trained, and other AI models, FFX, et cetera. Um, there's people that have the data and, and want the data, and in between we have a whole bunch of data marketplaces and the commons. 
So this is the vision. So imagine the substrate makes it really easy to build these marketplaces. The idea of the block rewards, once again, is add to the data commons and make money. Uh, Stuart Brand, a famous futurist thinker, et cetera, um, he has a quote from a long time ago, which is, data wants to be free. And it also wants to be expensive. The reason data wants to be free is because of the physics of bits. It wants to be expensive because the creators of the data need to get paid to feed their families. Put the data out there for anyone to download. Um, and, uh, but th so the people that are downloading and getting the data, um, they're getting it for free. But the people that are serving up the data can feed their families because there's inflation. There are block rewards <coughs> if you actually spend the resources to help serve up the data. Bring the compute to the data itself. So this is what, um, and what you need though is you need an intermediary that um, helps the, you know, myself and each of you to provide your data in a way where you've got this uh, sovereign personal data that you're holding onto. You're giving keys to specific data scientists to actually do their neural network training or to do their AI modeling more generally. So the, the, the key trick here is to bring AI compute to the data with the middleware layer being this public utility network. That is actually critical. No single entity can own or control this. Um, so there's a few ways to think of this. Um, one of them is think of this overall, this public utility network, as an AI compute pipeline. So back in the day, you know, there was MapReduce, and Google ha built this internally in order to basically speed up the computation to parallelize computation across many machines. And the core of these is basically a, an AI compute pipeline. In comes some raw data, and you've got um, then you do some cleaning via compute. You, you've got the trained data that you store, and then you train the model, and then you um, store the model, and then you have some new input data, and then you finally um, output the predicted, some predictions, right? So um, overall then, if you think about who's providing the data and who's providing the compute, well, what if you open that up to the world and said, OK, in, in this overall compute DAG, this AI compute pipeline, We've got a whole bunch of um, organizations and people supplying data, right? And it can be from Web3 networks, like, like Filecoin or, or StorageA. Or it can be from Web2, like things out of S Amazon S3. Um, or it can even be individual organizations. So there's these tribes, if you will, providing data. You've also got tribes providing algorithms, you know, whether it's out of Scikit-Learn, one of the top ML frameworks, um, or you know, specific um, algorithms from com competitors in Numeri, et cetera. Um, and then we've got the compute tribes, the people doing the compute. And you can have, now, um, once again, Web2 networks uh, like Amazon EC2, Web3 networks like Golem or, or Truebit, as well as computing behind the firewall if needed. Storage, um, similar to the data, but once again, the, there's the people holding the data and the people storing. Um, and finally, analytics, et cetera. So now you can think of this as an inter-service network, a, ne a network where there are services provided in this overall compute DAG. Once again, this is um, necessary for uh, an AI commons when you're actually trying to bring compute to the data itself. That it's a network of networks. So um, later on, we'll have Yuta from Parity talking about um, Polkadot a as a network of networks to connect Ethereum and Bitcoin and so on. Um, well, uh, and that's a, a wonderful um, you know, paradigm. If you're uh, a crypto person, you can think of what we're doing in Ocean as uh, sitting on top of uh, things like Polkadot. Um, where it's sort of L2, whereas the polka dots of the world are L1. But if you're an AI person, if you're just building AI tools, um, then it's simply an L1 network, um, where it's a network of networks simply for the AI stack. In the AI world, you actually have a completely different stack. And so what we're aiming for with Ocean is really to target this AI stack, where we're, we're drawing on things like Jupyter and, and Apache Flink and these sorts of things in order to actually make uh, AI itself decentralized to spread the benefits of AI. There's already an existing AI stack. In the last two or three years, Jupyter has just massively taken off. So imagine if you're uh, a data scientist, an AI person that is uh, building with Jupyter. Imagine now you can simply start to hook in uh, crypto, Web3. So uh, we actually have uh, a system running that hooks Jupyter to a MetaMask wallet. In fact, any, web MetaMask, uh, any Web3 wallet, because it's using the Web3 li library under the hood. So um, this is very nice. So you can basically now um, grab data, um, publish data, even earn block rewards, et cetera. Uh, and the overall paradigm is to keep the data science tooling. You know, why throw out that existing stack? And then every data set is an asset. And therefore, also, every Jupyter notebook is an asset. right? And when I say asset, I mean something that can be um, framed as a non-fungible token, for example. Um, and uh, you can have uh, service execution agreements around that, one thing leading to the next, leading to the next. I talk about how they get new benefits. And there's really three main ones. Uh, way more data. I talked about this via the data commons. 
and um, enterprise data without data escapes, right? And how do you do this? It's on-premise compute. So if you're an enterprise and you have tons of data, you're asking, how do I monetize this? yet you're worried about it escaping, the answer is bring the compute to the data, um, and then let the compute happen, and, and then basically sell the access to the data, but only after it's computed, right? So that's a way to thread that needle. The second is provenance in the data and AI training. Um, a friend of mine uh, used to run um, data at SoundCloud, and they had built an amazing neural network model um, that did very nice recommendations, but they couldn't use it. The reason they couldn't use it, because they had some data sets where they didn't know where they came from. So it would have been illegal to use it simply um, because uh, they didn't know the provenance, the, the origins of them, some of those data sets. Um, by the way, with GDPR, now you actually need to explain every single AI model that you use. So GDPR might end up being um, a mandate for explainability uh, in terms of provenance and so on. And finally, you know, if you're a poor, aspiring PhD student, um, you invent a new algorithm, imagine if you can actually help to monetize that right away. So uh, you come up with a cool new data set, a cool new algorithm, um, you label some data, this is a way to start to um, get some more income that way. And of course, for generating and making data available itself for sort of this context of generalized mining. So I've talked about you know, this, this overall vision of um, AI for good uh, to, towards an AI commons um, and really towards uh, sustainable development for the planet um, you know, to help make Greta proud. And uh, so I'm going to start to give a few applications here uh, of what this can look like. Uh, so one of them is uh, water quality, and this is something that Ixo Foundation is working on. We're, we're working with them on it. Uh, so in this case, there's forest restoration and, um, to help water supply. And you want to understand how much uh, can forest restoration help the water supply. The satellite data is super useful for that. And ideally, the satellite data is out there in the commons. So this is one of the use cases that Ixo is working on. And imagine that all the satellite data, as well as the forest data and so on, is actually all available for the whole planet to see and to use via basically a unified API. And also, the people who are supplying that data to make it um, available, there's actually block rewards for that. And that's actually, um, yeah, one of the use cases. We're working closely with a company called Connected Life out of Munich, which is actually doing this for Parkinson's disease. Um, and so this, of course, you can connect data sets across um, borders, across hospitals, across different jurisdictions, and promote uh, research collaboration uh, more broadly. Another one is this WEF spin-off called Grow Asia, and it's really helping uh, farmers to allocate fertilizer. So I grew up on a farm in rural Canada, and every year we had a fixed budget in order to, um, to uh, a fertilizer, how much fertilizer do we put in, and at the bottom of a hill, you actually have uh, water that flows there, so you don't need as much fertilizer. Near the tops of the hills, the water flows away from rainfall, so you don't need as much fertilizer, so you need more fertilizer there. So how do you actually figure out the optimal allocation? And an answer is more data, more AI. And so uh, the, and the, the places that would need this the most are the people with the tightest budgets. And this is, you know, uh, in this case, Grow Asia is targeting Asia. You know, if you're a policymaker, you're, tr you're trying to do things like, okay, how do we promote GDPR? How do we resolve this tension of AI benefiting and therefore wanting more data, but at the same time wanting to preserve privacy? Um, and so imagine if there was kind of a way to help address this. And this is actually what we're working on with the government of Singapore, their data authorities, where um, by bringing the compute to the data, it can help to resolve this challenge. You actually get the benefits of sharing data at the same time as addressing privacy. So uh, GDPR is met. And in fact, it's our dream that we won't need as many <coughs> things like GDPR in the future because it will be naturally a part of our substrate of civilization where there's just this public utility network for all that makes this possible. Everyone owns and controls their own data. They give permissions to people as they see fit. They revoke permissions as they see fit. Now, uh, a, mo a movement that has grown out of the AI for Good movement um, at the a AI for Good Summit, something called the AI Commons, where um, many top AI researchers, as well as UN agencies and the AI XPRIZE folks, are driving together towards this AI Commons. Um, and basically, they're, they're driving towards working with us of, um, as this common substrate. Uh, those of you who are developers here, you might ask, OK, how close are we to reality on this? And you know, if I was giving this talk a year ago, I, I would have been like, we've got a lot of work to do. But I'm happy to tell you now, we're much, much closer. There's docs.oceanprotocol.com. You can start, go there and start building now. Um, there's a testnet running. Uh, if you're a data scientist and you want to start playing there, you can go to datascience.oceanprotocol.com and click Get Started. And you can actually kick off a Jupyter Lab instance. So it's basically your own Jupyter notebook that's being hosted. And um, yeah, so this is an example of getting sort of 
getting going with an ocean node, uh, and you can see that we've got a pretty dolphin. We like all sorts of ocean characters, dolphins. I especially like jellyfish. Um, I've talked about this broad goal of the sustainable development, the UN SDGs, um, and AI for good as a means for AI to help drive the SDGs. The question is, how do we scale that? And the answer is, blockchain can make a big difference, a blockchain public utility network for the AI commons. Thank you.